Well, Richard, just for my friends uh, that are disc jockeys out there who, who were, uh-oh, we have a timeout. Oh, that's a portable. Yeah, it was kind of loud, wasn't it? Thought we were in a rainstorm. An unlikely rock star you were, but you certainly were out there in between Jimi Hendrix and Cream and Led Zeppelin in the 60s. Richard Harris popped in. So congratulations from MacArthur's Park. It was still, uh, 20 years later, it's still a wonderful song. It is, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised with the introduction because I never considered myself, you know, in the rock world at all. We made the album as a, you know, I suppose just really sort of a, I won't say it's a joke. We weren't joking, but we're very serious about it. But we, we didn't do it seriously, professionally seriously. Although Jimmy is a professional songwriter, I certainly didn't consider myself a singer or in that world at all. I certainly enjoyed the couple of years I was in it, and I enjoyed touring, doing those one-night stands and all those groupies, and I took advantage of that. It must have been strange, though, because you, you cut the song, and it did have a phenomenal success. I'm sure the record company had no idea that it was going to be as big as it was. Well, according to them, according to the record company, it was not successful. I never saw a penny from it. <laughs> One of those accounting got, guys again in Hollywood. Yeah, I never I got a Where did they go to school to learn how to do that? That's right, creative accounting is called. But um, anyway, anyway, one didn't do it for that. I mean, I was amazed. We were amazed it was so successful. And you know, the strange thing about that song was, was that the B-side, it was a MacArthur Parks, the B-side. Hmm. The A-side is Didn't We? That's right. And Didn't We got on the charts. He was on the charts first, and then some DJ in San Francisco turned it over and said, what was on the B-side of this? He turned over, MacArthur Park, history. So you had A and B-side on the charts. Does it make you happy if you still tune around WCBS in New York? Oh, here yeah. Today, you? Yeah, I, I still get a kick out of uh, when I hear it, when I, you know. Can you still sing it? Yeah. Get that high note at the end? Uh, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's 28 years ago. I doubt it now. You got to drop it an octave or two. In this new Clint Eastwood film, Unforgiven, you have a very unusual part of an uh, English gunslinger. Did that just jump off the page at you when you read that? Well, um, the character, I understood the character because um, I understand that type of Englishman because they festooned my nation like for five or six hundred years. You know, the kind of the British opened up their jails during the Black and Tan period and they sent an army of, uh, of cutthroats to Ireland to maintain peace people who were in jail for murder and rape, aggravated assault. They were given uniforms and sent to Ireland. And even prior to that, during the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, they were sent over to Ireland. They were given free land just to maintain their empire. So I knew that. I knew that. And you know, the real aristocracy or the real blue blood, they didn't travel like that. Um, they weren't uh, sent overseas to maintain you know, the land. They, were they sent people like English Bob who were really sort of spivs, really. And when I read the script, I said to Clint, you know, uh, it'd be great if I could do this. It'd be great if I could play this man as a very sort of upper class fake. And at the end of the picture, when he gets, you know, when he gets the hell kicked out of him by, by Hackman, that maybe all of that drops. And you really see that behind it all, he's really a sort of a low type, low life guy. So Clint said, yeah, that's great, go for it. I got afraid of it sometimes, you know, shooting the picture, but he kept encouraging me to go for it. Sounds like a good, you know, I have, Hollywood's done almost every story you can do, and it sounds like, has anybody done a movie with releasing these scuzzbag guys out of prison and going to Ireland and, uh, you know, becoming soldiers or whatever they were? Has that been done? No one ever made a movie about the Black and Tans in Ireland, but that was the most horrible period like a good in movie world movie. history, yeah. Because it happened, of course, the World War was coming up then at that time. The British Army were, were engaged overseas. They didn't know what to do. So they, they said, let's, f let's get an army together. They called them the Black and Tans. Let's get an army together, and they opened up all the prisons and said, look, we'll give you uh, suspended sentences, and we'll give you land over there, and we'll give you uh, pardons. You put on uniforms, go over and kick the hell out of the it's Irish. Kind of like the Dirty Dozen, but not yeah, quite. Yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of director is Clint Eastwood? He's obviously a very good director, but you've worked with different kinds of people. How's his style? Well, I found him very, <coughs> I, I kind of, the, the great thing about him was I felt that he created a, an, an area of security around the actor. You know, that uh, nothing interfered with the concentration, nothing interfered with what you were doing and the joy of what you were doing. Um, the set was always beautifully controlled. I, in, fact, I, in fact, in the 50 odd movies I've made, I've never been in a movie that was so well organized. His preparation is, is, is astonishing. 
crews. I mean, you know, you always find a group in a picture who either hates the producer or hates the director or whatever. Never have I seen such such universal love for a guy. Well, he'd just shoot him. Yeah, the, well, if he didn't no, 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 this crew had for him. And of course, the point is that he has worked with them all for so yeah. long. He's going to make a movie. He calls all the boys in, and they all come and join him because he treats them well. She's a gentleman, really, and uh, and they and, and they love it. Love, I mean that. And uh, there was no friction. And you got a guy like Hackman, me, him, Freeman. You thought maybe we're going to have one day of that. None of that. There was none of it. There was no reason for it. So is Clint kind of laid back? Is that what you'd say? Just like that. Just like he is. Lay back, but in control because he has done the preparation. It's ready for you to walk in and do it. So you get the impression that he's a student, basically, of film, that he knows where he's oh, going oh, with it. He's, oh, boy, I tell no, you. I, he's done the movie in his head before he shoots it. I work with some of the great directors in the world, like John Huston I've worked with, Marty Ritt I've worked with, Lindsay Anderson I've worked with. I prepared a movie with Fellini. I prepared a movie for four months with Igmar Bergman, some of the best directors in the world. This guy knows precisely the camera. He knows exactly what he wants. He knows how to get it. He knows what that little thing there is picking up, and what it's not going to pick up, and how it picks it up. It's astonishing. And if he said to you, just move that much to the left, you know there's a reason for it. Mm. And it doesn't hurt that he uh, is directing himself, too. I mean, does he just run from behind the camera? Well, now, strangely enough, I have no scenes with him. That's true. In the picture. So I don't know that. I assume from the kind of success that his pictures have, that which he was in, he directed. He knows. However he manages it, he manages it mm. and does it well. Yeah, it, 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 the whole thing is amazing. How do you look at work now compared to how you did when you first started? Well, I'm not as, I'm not as, uh, <coughs> I don't have to work. I mean, I'm, I think this is the great thing about when you get to my age and you are clever. You know, I was, with, in all my wildness and this Rabelaisian, uh, you know, character that I was, was projected quite tr rightly to by the press. I was also very shrewd, and so I don't have to work for a living, and so therefore I can do what I want to do now, when I want to do it, and so the pressure is not there. Uh, I'd prefer. I just did a picture with uh, with um, Sam Shepard that he wrote and directed, called The Silent Tongue, and that was really. I kind of feel some other. If you're going to carry a picture, I don't have to carry this. This is Clint Eastwood. He's got Clint. He's got Hackman, and he's got Morgan Freeman. So the pressure is off you. You know what I mean? They're carrying the picture. Uh, I, I did a, a guest spot also with uh, Harrison Ford over the summer here in Patriot Games. Right. But if I'm going to get involved in a picture that I carry, then I'm meticulous about it. And I assumed correctly that Clint was that meticulous about his picture, and, that's, uh, and so was Harrison Ford with his picture, so I don't have to worry about that. Uh, I'm going to do a film uh, next year here called uh, uh, I'm Soul Clap Hands, in which I'm the star of. I'm meticulous about it. We're supposed to start shooting next month. I wouldn't do it. I said, I put it off to April because the script isn't correct. So I don't have to work. So you're having a good time now. I, yeah. Uh, Did you have a good time back, you know, say 20 years ago? A different kind of time. Yeah. It was hectic. But now you're just enjoying life and enjoying your work. Yeah, if I was to write my biography, I'd call it a fine madness. You know, it was wonderful. It was absolutely, I would not have changed one single drunk or one single hangover or one single affair. Mm -hmm. I'd have married the same two women again. If I had my life, if I had to do it all over again, I'd have made the same mistakes, had the same joys. I had no regrets at all. Where are you Except, living? no, I can't drink anymore. Where are you living? The Bahamas. Well, that's an interesting place. I wouldn't, that would kind of surprise me. I like the Bahamas. A little warm, but... Uh. Well, yeah. I like it uh, because I live on top of an island there. You can't get to me by road, you, only by boat. So, like, that's my security. That's where I can cut off. Like Clint, I can cut off and not see anybody for months. Connery used to hang out there a lot. He's, play well, he's got a, he has he's a, got a place, place there too. Yeah, he does. He does. Yeah. He, well, he's the same kind of guy, Sean. Sean is not a part of the business. What we call you know, the business, like Warren and and uh, Sylvester and that. They're part of that part of the power structure of the business. Yeah, if you cut them, film would come out. Yeah, or that's right. Hollywood would just bleed out. Of yeah, them. we believe there's another kind of life. You know, Connery believes there's another kind of activity. He you wants know. to golf. Yeah, and Clint loves his helicopter. And, I love to be by myself down the Bahamas.